have you ever heard of somebody being applauded for not seeking forgiveness? In this post, we're going to explore that. Hello and welcome to Gleaning the Scriptures. In this video, I'm going to go over a article that I wrote about forgiveness and linking true forgiveness to Daniel and his companions in the book of Daniel. And then later we'll go over some things about differences between walking the journey of genuine true forgiveness and what could be a counterfeit set up to waste your time. Thank you for being here and I hope that you enjoy the reading of this post. You can find this post and others like it at Gleaning the Scriptures dot wordpress dot com fair warning what you are about to hear is a mind bender it at times could get the emotions going for some loved ones but remember it is purposed on bringing clarity and focus through guidance and applying usable skills during times of uncertainty you may find that you have to admit fault in order to move forward victorious this post, if taken seriously and applied, could multiply your blessings and drastically improve your relationship with God, especially if that relationship has been stale for a while. I know the audio quality here isn't good. I apologize for that. I don't have expensive equipment. Daniel and his companions were set apart among all those who were brought into Babylonian captivity Daniel himself was set apart still further from his small quartet. You see, Daniel was a league above his companions in the way he carried himself. This undoubtedly had to do with Daniel's accepting obedience to God, exploring forgiveness as it was presented, along with humility, self-discipline, and absolutely handing the throne of his heart over to the Messiah. Daniel certainly had his imperfections, but God does not spend much, if any, time recounting them in the book of Daniel. Instead, we see fearless faith and staunch standards from Daniel, resulting in him becoming an integral and valued member of the Babylonian royalties, confidants, and counselors. We begin our mind-bending journey in messianic exploration today during an event in which Daniel was not the focus. Historians like to lean towards the idea that he was on a journey, accomplishing some political business for the king. Me personally, I believe he was right there in the very presence of the king when his friends were being thrown into the fire, quietly being obedient to God and exercising his faith even in a time such as that. I believe Daniel's prayer life guided him in requiring silence from himself. This challenging requirement panned out such that he saw God stretch out one of his arms, being a good father to him and his friends. We never see a disrespectful word from Daniel to the king. It can't be that Daniel was skilled in the worldly discipline of wearing a professional mask of false piety before the king, could it? It is more likely that Daniel had genuinely forgiven the king for all he had done. From the beginning of the story, he was getting to know the king as a friend and as his king. The end of their time together reveals that Daniel and the king had a relationship that was founded on trust and understanding. Even though their differences were vast and seriously altered the course of one another's lives, and the event we are focusing on, we see Daniel's friend's response to the king coming from quite a different place. Daniel's friends could not have taken the time in prayer and obedience needed to find the depth of forgiveness that Daniel was blessed with. No. Thus, the disrespectful outburst in a time of high pressure. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, 
our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Compare their response to Daniel's speech patterns before his king. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. Daniel 4.19 In both cases, the king was in a position where he was at odds with God, and in both cases, God displayed his grace to the king through the quartet of Hebrews. All considered, the stark contrast in their speech patterns is quite obvious. Now is where this article is going to just begin to scratch the surface of venturing off the easy path to break down the walls of conventional thinking or wisdom. Shadrach's group's response to King Nebuchadnezzar was in defense of their disobedience to the king. Disobedience that ended in death by unalterable decree. The king's rage was appropriately manifested in a very hot furnace whose droll flames killed even his own men, who, obeying his voice, threw the trio into the furnace. When these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. Why was it that both Shadrach's group and Daniel served the same God, yet Daniel was not represented here while Shadrach's group was being thrown into a torrid furnace? Forgiveness is a very narrow pass with a variety of twists and turns, caves and deadly drop-offs, through a mountain whose top is nothing but snow and ice that spells death for all who attempt to climb over its summit. There are many long, dead-end tunnels, and only the one who knows the way can guide a victim through forgiveness's pass to the other side. Without forgiveness, a victim is left with poison to drink. Once the path has been traversed, the other side promises a clean stream of everlasting water that flows from the throne of heaven itself. Shadrach's group must have known that forgiveness is key, as they were part of Daniel's quartet, yet in this story we see only Daniel using speech patterns that reflect having found his way through the duplicitous pass. You can see the poison the speaker was left to drink coming out before the king. Their response comes from so many places of truth. You can see that the lads knew for sure that God is God and is the only God. The other gods were trash. God will ensure deliverance. Faith in God is powerful. Very powerful. Worshipping carved images is displeasing to God. He spoke from a genuine place and showed how he truly felt. He had been practicing self-control, discipline, and patience for Babylon for possibly many years at this point, but the strength of false piety has a breaking point in here. It broke. He had no more patience left. The king was infuriated. Let's digress. In Egypt, when Moses was going to have words with his adopted brother Pharaoh, God performed many miracles. Here in our story of Shadrach and his companions, a miracle was performed as well. A miracle is something people marvel at, but Yeshua tells us not to marvel at miracles, while he himself is seen marveling 
only when a very hard heart or evil so thick he can barely believe it is before him. Has the following question found its way into your mind yet? Why has the Savior told us not to marvel at a miracle? I mean, it is a marvelous thing, isn't it? As Monty Judah from Lion and Lamb Ministries puts it, a miracle is God's kingdom operating on earth. The reason an astonishing miracle is so marvelous is because something that is on the shifting, decrepit, shaky, and tropical, yes, that is a made-up variant of the word entropy, in tropical path the world provides meets a small part of its kingdom function all of a sudden instead of slowly over time. It is like a firework going off or a bomb exploding, but instead of sudden destruction and chaos, it is the opposite, order and proper functioning for its forever purpose. Understanding that, look, the miracles performed in Egypt were Egypt's many veins producing their true fruit. It was not that God was forcing an end on Egypt and their evil gods. Instead, see that God, in his grace, had been protecting Egypt from their demise all along so that he could display his power to many generations, as he so gracefully puts it. Ancient Egypt was as if a farmer had been planting weeds, but fruit trees sprang up for centuries. One day, God performed a manifold set of miracles, letting the weeds they had been planting come up all at once and in full force. The Father himself does not plant water or grow weeds. He allows them within his framework and guiding buffers for a short time for the sake of all righteousness. In recalling the exodus from Egypt, a mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. Exodus 12, 38. Matthew Henry's concise commentary on the characteristics of this event notes, the children of Israel set forward without delay. A mixed multitude went with them, some perhaps willing to leave their country laid waste by plagues, others out of curiosity, perhaps a few out of love to them and their religion. But there were always those among the Israelites who were not Israelites. Of those mixed, who, perhaps out of love for the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, was one of two who went forty years plus one and further still. Caleb, for he came not from an Israeli womb. Surely none of the men who came up from Egypt, from twenty years old and above, shall see the land of which I swore to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, because they have not wholly followed me, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have fully for they have wholly followed Yehovah. Numbers 32, 11 through 12. This Egypt's destruction again was a miracle based on the definition above and that Egypt began to function or became dysfunctional rather in its realistic capacity to function or to cease to function as it were. All of this said about miracles and still more. They always serve a purpose. Miracles have a forever function that is manifold to display God's character, the way he functions, and to teach all who experience and hear about one. Finding footing on the primary path and coming back to Daniel from our rabbi trail, the Lord in his grace was using Babylon to throw chaff and tares into the fire. Like in Egypt, a destruction sown of their own doing. In a further act of mercy, Shadrach's group was saved from the flames. That fire was heated seven times its norm, a clue in this riddle. 
Consider the parallel event when Moses was on the mountain, learning the law and not eating. He was in the presence of God and learning a great deal in that time. Similarly, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in a circumstance that gave them another chance to try their steps in walking circumspectly through the path of forgiveness, having a newfound, faith-filled renewal of energy from the event to stoke their fires. From here, we can only speculate to what became of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after the awesome experience they had from displaying such great faith even in their seemingly decrepit state of unforgiveness. We do not hear much about them from that point forward. We can hope that they found their way through the mountain and drank the sparkling, cool, crystal clear water on the other side. Daniel, on the other hand, we know continued down the path that is planted alongside that glorious river. We know he traversed many mountains, was guided through many such passes, and was led through life's way to find the end of the 70 years. Daniel, in his faith, which is obedience, learned the skills necessary to build up his self-value, his true worth, and his ability to work for Hashem Mayal Kol Hashemot, the name above all names, the name above all the names. The first time he interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar, the response was a miracle, a reflection of what is true. Daniel was given a mansion, complete with lots of gold and other riches. He was made one of another trio, whose power was only usurped by the king and God himself. I say once more, Daniel's real value and ability was recognized, promoted, and used. The kingdom, operating rightly on earth, a miracle again. A miracle that happened alongside forgiveness. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. All four in the quartet were most likely just in God's eyes, yet one was more pleasing, more able, more valuable in doing God's work. All were being led to salvation, most likely, but one loved him best and was rewarded thusly. In loving God more deeply, Daniel had it revealed to him the respectable, honorable, praiseworthy qualities in his vicious overlords. He was guided through forgiveness and was made to see where he could be helpful to the king and where being helpful meant to keep things to himself. It's the end of page one. I'm about to start page two. If you've learned a lot, I suggest that you pause the video here, take a break, and use this time to digest, maybe even for several days what you just learned, before beginning page two, which will start now. Just how the miracles of God can display both judgment of good qualities unto honor and judgment of bad qualities unto dishonor, so too does forgiveness have a complicated matrix of properties and even counterfeits? You have learned so far about Daniel's treasure trove, reaped from sowing genuine forgiveness. A key to forgiveness working properly, as it works so well for Daniel, is for there to be a true wrong committed. Imagine a man showing up to the pass and arguing with God about whether or not he was truly wronged. Daniel, having his country conquered at war, his family and friends stripped from their homes, some beaten and murdered, and the nobility taken into slavery, was certainly a string of manifold true wrongs. The wrongs were not authentic simply because they were painful. An action being painful does not denote a wrong in God's eyes. Being stolen from, or a friend or family member being killed, counts as authentic. 
Hearing somebody speak curse words in front of children or seeing swear words on a bumper sticker or t-shirt or watching somebody use God's name for their own devices also merits the prompting to consider forgiveness. Knowing somebody even covets your wife too merits righteous judgment, level-headed action, and an intention to begin exploring forgiveness. We live in a world today whose emotionally charged atmosphere reaps its share of dysfunction and the breaking of its people. When one person crosses another's personal set of standards for how they like being cared for, it seems to merit the opportunity to forgive and look for the delicious fruit that results when coming out the other side of forgiveness's pass. Yet, not so fast. True forgiveness comes only from the Father, right? Consider, there is not a commandment that justifies a beloved one to judge somebody as having wronged them if, for example, they have pointed out a flaw within the beloved one. There is a reason why the Lord has set his scripture holy as it is, such that there are standards and values and statutes we are encouraged to learn and live by. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. True knowledge is found within the pages of the Lord's 66 book canon. Canon defined as measuring tape. Did you know that every scroll was written by a Hebrew, likely all Jewish authors in fact? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them, the Jews, were committed the mysteries of God. Roman, Romans chapter 3, verse 2. In speaking of the mysteries of God, consider a billionaire who lives life lavishly but seems far away. Why? Somebody who has that kind of money has it. In short, because they are responsible, they have... They have a set of standards that they stick to. We are not calling into question the morality of their standards or to whom their allegiance rests, but simply looking objectively at the fact that their standards are learned rules that guide their decisions. Billionaires are mysterious. This is a living metaphor which glorifies God. Billionaires are a mystery because they cannot share their standards with others. Even if they did, most people would find what they were being taught to be intolerable, whether for good or evil. The good would be vilified, and the evil would be ripped to pieces, or fearfully stepped around by most. This thing is a reflection of the Father. He is a mystery, because the standards by which he governs reality define his very character, and most find those standards intolerable. Even people within his own family cannot bear some of the ways he ensures existence will be paradise in the life to come. Therefore, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Proverbs 25, 2. We are dipping into a whole other can of worms here. But this is a reason why God wrote the Bible in, and Yeshua spoke in riddles and dark sayings. He comes often in a cloud. It is a reason why scripture alone is not enough. It is a reason why we need the helper. In order for authentic forgiveness to even begin, let alone fully grow, a true wrong must a true wrong based on God's standards must have been committed against the one who seeks the intrepid journey that the pass through the mountain holds. When what was done caused discomfort or inflicted a blow resulting in a considerable amount of pain, it is time to look at God's standards to see what was hurt. He is the guide through the pass, the holder of the keys, and 
the creator of the mountain being passed through. He makes good rules, remember? If he does not see the event as a wrong against the person, he will lovingly challenge to seek a different, more appropriate journey on a different pass through a different mountain. Sticking with our example, a flaw being pointed out, whether in brusque manners or through skillful, warm fellowship, whichever, is not a wrong in God's eyes. There is no law against love. Love is the innocent party, no matter how many people vilify it, and they will vilify love, no doubt. It is Satan who is to blame for having enslaved folks to their faults, remember? But God sees the malfunction just the same as the loving party sees it. He knows it well and sent his desire to see it changed into the loving party. Why is God so bent on improving his children in various ways and diverse manners? It is his love, his love, I say again, causes him to desire for us to bear his image more accurately. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, self-control against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 23. Think about your own life, gently, but objectively and staunchly, for a minute. When somebody corrects you, is your response one of gentleness? Self-control? Does the fruit of the Spirit have a home in you when humility is required? Those are hard questions. The world is designed around ensuring people do not react well to correction. But in Messiah, all things are possible. All things are possible in Messiah. Let's look to him and his example now. What did he spend most all of his time doing? saving. I came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. Look to the Gospels. If, this, if the Messiah was not encouraging a corrected somebody, he was correcting. Whether it be internal or external, he went from one place to another healing correcting physical infirmities, or correcting things that were functioning improperly within his beloved people's nefeshot, Hebrew for beings. His beloved people's beings, correcting things that were functioning improperly within his beloved people's beings. That is his character, his example, and our holy duty to one another. We have one commission to the world, and the same to our brothers and sisters. Bring them to Messiah. Yet, that result is met differently for either party. Once somebody has accepted salvation, that part is done. There is no need to continually lay the same foundation over and over again. Unless, of course, it was laid improperly then it was never really laid to begin with. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Messiah, let us go on to perfection. Bad translation. Perfection is translated from the Greek, teleos, which means wholeness. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Messiah, let us go on to wholeness not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Hebrews 6, 1. Do not misunderstand. Accepting Messiah's salvation is a monumental thing. Awesome, precious, majestic, and honorable. It is a means to a beginning, 
it is the first sign that the truth could maybe reside in a person. Soon, if the acceptance takes root as it was designed, improvement is what is naturally sought, even through trial and tribulation, out of love for God. This is not meant to be done alone. In this, moving beyond the elementary principles, applying forgiveness only where it is meant to fit is accepted and found quite the usable skill. There is no more vilifying love when it presents itself in a form that is not pleasant at the time. As Paul puts it, we should be of one mind in this goal of improving. And why not? For we are a bride. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Messiah Yeshua has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have one mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 15. How encouraging. It says that it is for the very reason of making you whole that salvation was presented to you to begin with. It is an exchange where one gives him their life. An exchange for a life where he is the master of it, all of it. It is quite understood that killing what is given up was the plan from the start. This makes room for what is pleasing to him and able to serve him skillfully. The world is very much at odds with this idea and, instead, looks to have folks spending their time working on other things irrelevant, or at best, stuck in a pattern of laying the same foundation over and over again, which is not just, but debt to God. But if Messiah is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead is living in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Romans chapter 8, 10 through 13. Today, we need more understanding and friendships in a world bent on divisive intentions. We find ourselves in a time that is on the tail end of a few hundred years that we're all wrapped up in seeking comfort. We are moving towards I am not sure what. If I had to guess, I say it looks like obedience will be the focus of the final few dozen decades before Messiah returns. Daniel knew forgiveness intimately and knew it was a worthy tool in tending his garden if the soil called for it. Daniel was self-disciplined, kind, tender, inviting, stern, respectful, and honored both of the kings he was serving. He overcame the challenges his time presented him with in the tenderness, strength, and the power of Messiah Yeshua. He was inviting in that he was a servant of the kingdom of heaven, hoping to welcome others to the same freedom he found in walking a path paved with miracles, inviting even the king who took away his chances of having a family of his own and forced Daniel to serve his needs instead. 
When flaws were pointed out to Daniel, much like his friend Nebuchadnezzar, we can rest assured that he did not take it personally. He did not find the messenger an evil prosecutor. He did not find fault with those the Lord was using to help save him from the enemy's dysfunction found within. Plenty of faults were there to find. Be sure of that. Certainly, he felt ashamed for a time or a moment. Moving forward, Daniel was the kind of man whose God-formed integrity drove him to see the flaw as a surmountable, yet manifold issue within the workings of his garden, a garden that he was responsible for. The result? Daniel put his trust in God, put his hand to the plow, and began walking the God-ordained steps necessary to surmount the flaw. We can only hope and speculate that Daniel's friends found the same path for themselves on this side of paradise before the time of investing for them was complete. Daniel knew how to forgive. Daniel was a good tree. Daniel produced fruit.